Hey animators, what's up? Rusty Gray here from RustyAnimator.com and this tutorial we're going through an animation walk cycle step by step. If you don't know the key poses or understand the locomotion behind, I recommend you check out our walk cycle animation blueprint video first. You can click here or in the description below for that. Now, let's take a look at what we'll be animating. Walk cycles typically intimidate a lot of new and even experienced animators for good reason. They are really challenging. Why? Well, we see people walk all the time. So even if we don't have a lot of practice animating, we know when even the slightest bit of a walk isn't quite normal. I mean, how fast do you notice someone who has a limp or someone who is drunk? Exactly. It's almost instantaneous. This tutorial will really help you eliminate all of those big challenges though that you're up against. So with that said, let's get started. As you can see, I'll be animating in Maya since it's the industry standard for most movie and game jobs. As for the character rig, I'm using the Body Mechanics Rigs Mega Pack by Joe Daniels. I'm not sponsored by him, but I do find that these rigs are very robust compared to most options out there. Of course, you can use whatever rig you like, but if you want to use this exact same one and you know copy all the values exactly, um, just check the link below. Animation-wise, I'll be using a layering approach, meaning I'll be working on one body part at a time. As the hips and the feet are the motor for the movement, that's where we're going to start. Then we'll tackle the upper body and the head, followed by the arms, and finally we'll do a polish pass on the legs for, you know, just smoother rotation in the feet, toe overlap, and just to minimize any knee pops and toning down of the overall body uh, to make things as basic as possible. So first up, we'll start with the feet and the hips, specifically on the contact poses. We can hide the upper body and the arms for now. That way I'm not distracted by anything else. And you can do this no matter what rig you have. If it's built into the control like I have here, or if you're going to the outliner, you can open up the rig and then find the geometry that you want, you know, break it down by body part, add it to a layer and hide it. So the contact pose, we're gonna pick a foot to be first. And just grab this left foot, bring it forward, grab this right foot, bring it back, and I want to bring the overall height for the hips down to, let's say, negative 1.5. Sounds good. And the other thing to note before we mess with the feet more, we'll go here and add some twist in the hips, as the hips really are responsible for pulling that leg forward in a walk. So we'll say negative 15. Okay, and now we'll go back to the feet here, this front foot, and we'll rotate it so that the heel is the only thing contacting the ground. Right now we're trying to figure out our gate of the walk, the distance between the feet meaning how far, how much distance do we cover between each step. And we want to find this straight leg position where it's not bent where the knee is really forward and it's not locked out to where, you know, the knee looks broken. Something like this. With the back foot, we're going to add some heel raise. Kick back even further. Let's say, style it to 30, actually. And let's just key all this. Key this, key this, key this. And now we'll just grab these pieces. Copy it to frame 25. So frame one and frame 25 will be the same because this is the step that loops. This is where it all hooks back up into a cycle. On frame 13, we'll have another contact pose, and it's the exact same thing except it's mirrored. 
So we can pull this foot forward to kind of match what we're doing here. Kill the raise heel and um, we'll add that foot rotate up. Add our 30 heel raise and bring this foot back. And if we flip between our two poses, we can make sure that our, our feet are relatively in the same spot in terms of how far they go. Don't worry about this too much as, um, you know, later on when we have one foot perfect, we can copy everything from, from one foot to the other. The other thing that we can't forget is to rotate the hips the other way, which shows us that we can kick this foot out a little bit more. Cool. So now that we've got that in, we can move on to the passing position. Okay, so now that we have our contact pose good enough, we can move on to the passing position and we'll go to frame seven. And since we're layering, we kind of get this automatic in betweening that, that gives us like a halfway point for our feet as they pass from one contact to the next, taking that, that step forward, right? So that's handy. You can just kind of go here, zero out the heel, rotation. This foot, since it's the one that contacts the ground, is is hitting, it's it's the contact pose, and here later the foot comes down. On frame seven, we're going to zero out this rotation, zero out the heel raise, and that'll be planted. That'll be the planted foot. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to raise the character up for the passing position so we get much more of a straight leg on that planted foot. And that way there's a bit of vertical change between the poses because they aren't identical. Like it's, all, it's always traveling somewhere and they shouldn't just be um, so robotic that the value is always the same in, as far as up and down, right? The other foot, the foot that's at the back of the walk that's coming forward, We'll be up in the air and we'll rotate it down so the toes point towards the ground. And we'll angle it back towards that pose here, kind of where it's coming from. And we're by doing this, we're 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 saying that the heel is going to be leading the foot pickup as it comes forward, right? And again, why we're doing this with the feet where they, they go back and forth in position is because this is a walking cycle. If you're, if you're having a character walk ahead, then you don't need to have the feet slide, but since the character doesn't cover any ground, we have to have something cover ground, and we're, we're cheating the, the feeling that he is walking um, by having the feet slide. So the other thing that most people forget with the passing position that's super important is if you imagine drawing a line from the ground up through the hips, through the center, we can kind of get a sense of the balance. Right now, it feels wrong, right? Well, what if we push it this way? Well, then it feels even worse, right? Because this foot is off the ground. We have no balance, no uh, foothold to handle our weight. So in this case, with this foot lifted, we have to kick it over to its extreme in the passing position. It's probably the single most important part of the passing position. Right, So it works in the contact pose because the weight is split evenly between both feet, but here we've got to kick it over, that way we can lift that foot. And since we're lifting a foot, just like this twist that helps us get, in, get this foot forward, we also need a bit of twist this way to raise a foot off the ground, right? That's what's, in a, in a basic walking cycle, you know, it's, it's common for it to happen here in the passing position. So we'll just say negative eight to keep the numbers simple. All right. And then we can copy what's going on here. We'll middle mouse drag from seven to 19. And we get the same exact thing. But 
just like with the contact poses. When they change, we have to mirror it. Right? And then, so, side to side changes as well. Right? So he's always covering ground from side to side, and now we need to adapt the feet. And I didn't copy the feet over so that we can get this automatic halfway in between. Key that down. This will be the lifted foot this time. Right? So we'll lift that up, tilt it down, point it back, and this will be the planted foot. So we can play this from the side view. Our walk is starting to have some life. It's starting to feel like the character is taking a step because we have our first breakdown. But we really need to add a couple more poses to clean up the feet and add more weight to the walk, some sense of gravity. And we'll achieve that with the next two poses. The down pose will be starting, the first one will be on frame four. And just like the name suggests, it's the down extreme of the walk. So it's the lowest vertical point in the hips. And then rotation-wise, it's the lowest vertical point as well. So let's we'll just say, just say seven. Let's say minus five, right? And then we'll flatten out this foot, because the foot plants so that I can take the weight. And What's nice is we're getting that contrast and shape where we get the straight leg and then we get the bend, which gives the appearance, the feeling of weight. For the other foot in the down position, I'm just gonna copy, copy this entire foot from frame one to frame four so it's locks in place, and then we'll move it further back, and we'll raise the heel up to 60, right? Right, so this gives us the last point of contact with the ground with this foot before it picks off, picks up off the ground. So the toes are really the last piece clinging to the ground there as the heel takes off. Gives us a nice lift built in. And we're going to copy what's happening with the rotate X and the translate Y from the hips to frame 16. And we repeat with the feet what we just did. Throw out that planted foot, we'll copy from contact to the down, raise the heel, so 60 and we'll kick it back a bit. All right, and now that we have the down in there, that's good enough to, to rough that in, and we'll move on to the up position. So the up poses will happen on frame 10 and then 22. And just like the down position, there as the, the poses as it sounds, it'll be the high point for the pose, the extreme up. We'll just say, We'll say two for now, and it's also the extreme rotate up like the down is for the down. So we're gonna get a five. And then on frame 22, we'll go. We can copy the rotate X and the translate Y to frame 22 for the hit. For the foot, we're getting a bit of a lockout, but we're going to ignore that now and just add a bit of heel raise. So we'll say we'll say 15, and we might end up adjusting that, but for now that should be good enough. Uh, this foot, we can just kind of raise a little bit higher so that it favors the top of the arc, spacing-wise, like a bouncing ball, and the in-between is good enough there for that. Same deal here. 
raise that up a little bit, bring this back. And we're good for now. I'm just going to ignore this foot because this foot I think will end up just copying over. So as the, the legs and the hips are fairly roughed in now, we can move on to offsetting the rotation for the hips themselves. So the, um, the rotations won't be hitting their extremes at the same exact time as the translation up and down, which will give us a very natural arc to how the, the hips would rotate and roll in real life. Before we get into all that, we're going to select these controls that we've been animating, open up our graph editor, and we're going to cycle these curves. So this is telling uh, Maya to just repeat the curves that we have set, and if the endpoints are the same on frame 1 and 25, it will repeat identically what's happening on either end. What does this let us do? This lets us slide our animation around and try out different timing very quickly. You do have to be careful of tangents to try to smooth it out so that it hooks up perfectly with the cycle, but you know we can easily adjust that as we go. So now that we've done that for all controls on the feet and hips, we are going to start offsetting these. The hip rotation, we're going to start offsetting them by one frame at least. So we'll do this first, and then all of these rotations, we're going to have it offset by one frame at least. I'm going to try one frame here with the X, one frame later with the Z. Smooth that out so that it's not slowing down as it goes through this in between. And then for the rotate Y, is on the other control. Pull the back one. Now the hips have a much more natural roll to the entire movement. And all we had to do to get that was to just offset the rotations a bit. If we play this back, we can see we got a nice bounce in the body, nice rotations there, and the feet are kind of doing what they need to do. We still need to do a lot of feet cleanup, though, uh, later with the knees, especially, to keep from that distracting wobble that's happening, and then uh, clean up how the foot picks up. If we look in the front view, we'll see that, you know, it's it's kind of robotic. It's There's not much arc in there. There's only the the change as far as up and down goes. We need a little bit of side to side to make it more natural. So from the contact frame, it'll be closer towards the center of where the walk is. And you might have, it'll, it'll stay relatively still, but you might have a little bit of a shift in there to the side. It goes in a little closer as it stays down. And then as it picks up, that's when our foot can really swing out and give us more of an arc across the screen from side to side, right? And we can see because we've got an extra key here for this foot on the up pose and then the contact that they are in the same spot. We can either drag it like this or we could just go and let the computer handle the in-between. If we open up our graph editor, we can delete on the translate X that extra key. Right. We do this for one foot and then we'll copy it over to the other. Right. So we're refining this just a bit and we can save time by skipping that one for now. And we've developed um, a nice little arc on the pickup. To make this even more natural, what's kind of weird is how straight our rotation is with the foot. Right. If you look at this wave. Depending on if you're a guy or a girl, you know, this changes, but we can default to having a bit of twist in there, a little angle to the feet, so it's not quite so parallel. It makes our walk a bit more organic, right? And then we can kind of bring it more straight here, make it zero. And we can copy what's happening there in the rotation 
straight to frame 25, and then from 4 to As our foot picks up, it will probably, we should have some overlap to point back where it came from. We'll have a bit of a drag when it picks up later to where it, it points back from, from how it picks up, but for now we'll just key some rotation in there so the foot has has a rotation change and we'll save that for the polish phase so as the foot picks up we'll just drag it so that the toes point back where they came from and then there's this bit here where it finally rotates out kind of comes around Still delayed this way before it comes fully planted out, right? We can, we can give that a bit of a roll in there. Gives it more of an organic touch to the arc of the foot. The other thing we should try to sort out with our feet at this stage is the pickup of the foot itself. So it's a bit unnatural because we're using some heel, heel raise and then the heel raise is gone when it hits this uh, passing position. So this is a 3D software thing um, where you kind of have to get the rig to move naturally the way you want because this is changing the pivot of the foot, right? It's choosing to pivot from onto the top of the, the toes versus pivoting from the heel itself. The easiest way to really tackle that is to take this keyframe of the foot where it's down copy it so that at frame four and five is the same, the foot goes nowhere. And then we're going to kill the heel raise in one frame. We'll try to match it with rotation only and get it close there. We're doing like a manual in between for the foot pickup. Based off where the heel is, we need to change the angle, right? Because we're going to this position. We're, we're like doing our own in between. So we need to get that toe close. We'll probably go towards the, the tip of where the toe is. So it looks like it, it picks up from there. And then we have a far more natural pickup and in between that's much smoother for the eye. We can do that for the other foot as well, really quickly. Kill the heel raise, rotate the foot, rotate the foot down. And then as far as our in-betweens go from the front view, we just gotta be conscious of the keys that we put down and then let the computer in between in there, right? So it's, it's kind of going up and rotating how we want without this new key interfering. Let me delete that extra key, delete that extra key. and then we get a much more natural roll into our walk. We've got a little bit to sort out here. If we just pull up the graph editor, we can see that this, this bit here that's causing the foot to wig out over these couple frames and look a bit wall smacky poppy. Um, is because the rotation is going farther than in the contact pose. So the easiest way to fix that is just bring that rotation down, flatten this curve out so it's the top of the arc, and then it's a smooth rotation into this position.
and later in the polish phase we might be able to you know squeeze a bit more drag in there you know to really roll that foot forward but right now this is good enough with the feet and the hips in a decent spot now it's like blocking plus we can move on to the upper body so I'm going to turn on actually just the torso here to focus on what's happening um, in the chest so I'll select the two curves and we'll go to frame one this contact position and we're gonna quickly just kind of rough in what the chest is doing rotation wise this upper body um, in the contact position you know, just like the hips, the chest is responsible for pulling the arms into place. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to handle the rotate Y here in the contact position. So they'll be pulling the opposite arm from the leg that's forward. They'll be pulling that forward. So we'll twist to favor that arm that's going to be forward later. Okay. Maybe this rotation is too much. Maybe not. We'll, we'll, we can tweak it later I think it's good enough for now so we'll key that there and go to frame 25 key the same frame 13 do the opposite so negative 10 All right and then we'll go to our passing position and we'll do the same deal except as the whole body is really leaning over top of this leg the upper body kind of counterbalances the other way so we get the opposite. Let's say six for now. And we'll copy that frame 19, but we have to mirror it. So the upper body is really counter counterbalancing all the weight shifting that's going here to make sure that we don't fall. And then if we go to our down position, where the hips really hit the extreme down. We're going to take the rotate X, so that's the bend forward, just like the hips. We're gonna go two frames later than that, right? The upper body is behind what the hips are doing. There's a natural overlap there where, where everything doesn't happen at the same time. All the, the angles of rotation are, are varied in timing. So we'll rotate this down on this frame. It happens a bit later, and we'll key that there. We'll say seven for now. Maybe we'll dial it back later. And then we'll key the same on frame 16. And we'll go to our up pose on frame 10 and switch it. So seven there. All right. But again, we are going to offset it, so we'll grab these keys and just move them back two frames. And then our other up pose is on 22, so it's frame 24. We'll do the opposite, flipping it back, right? And if we just play this through, this gives us a natural up and down that feels, feels good with the movement in the hips, right? It seems to work. What's a bit funky though is what's snapping a little weird is our rotations. This key is off. Um, what we need to do to fix it is it's the cycling, right? So we've got we've got everything roughed in that we want, and we want to cycle this stuff. But we've got a problem on the Z, right? We've got this extra key that we didn't really need because we only keyed it in the passing positions. This pose and this pose is in our passing positions. So how do we make it cycle so that it doesn't give us this and we don't have to add extra keys? Well, we go to where we have a frame one here, take it back there. And then we're going to copy the rotate Z from here to from 1 to 25 and then if we drag it back if we remember where the key was originally 7 
then we get a perfect looping cycle. That's a quick trick to not add a bunch of extra keys to make the cycle loop. Okay. So we just need to do that for our other chess control as well. Drag all this back to frame one. Copy from here to frame 25. Loop it, and then we're good to go. And frame X, or uh, rotate X, we have the same issue. So we're going to go there and do the same trick. All right. We're on frame 6 there. So we're going to take that back to frame 1. And we're going to make sure that we copy from frame 1 to frame 25. And bam, we have a looping cycle. Dragged it back to frame six, and it's all good. Now we got a nice roll in the X, but remember we offset the animation, the rotations here with the Y and the Z in the hips. So we should do the same at least with the chest. Take both of our rotate Y curves and we will move them back one frame and our rotate Z curves we will move ahead one. With the chest quickly roughed in there and feeling okay with the offsets, we can move on to adding in the head and the neck. From the front view, we get this twist where the chest is pulling more towards screen right, the hips are pulling more towards screen left to, to favor each limb. The head will counter that. Um, so we'll tilt our head the opposite way of the chest. Key that and then copy that to 25. And frame 13 will do the same, but mirror it. Okay, that might be too much. We tend to keep our head pretty, pretty straight as possible. Okay, so we'll copy that to frame 25. And we can adjust that later, of course. On frame 7 is where our rotate Z is happening here. And we're going to counter that too. The, the hips are on frame 8, actually. It's one frame after the passing. And then our body's on 9, so we'll put this on 10. And the head and neck space, it's Y. And we need to be careful of our shape here. The neck is bending quite a bit in, in comparison to the head, so we'll correct that. Frame 19 is where the other passing position happens. And we'll copy everything over to there. One, two. So as you can see, we're, we're rotating it to keep the head straight as much as we can. In our side view, we're going to have the extra overlap for the down and the up position so the head doesn't hit a wall. If 
the player right now just smacks it, doesn't continue rotating, it hits this invisible wall of its face. So we have one frame offset from the hips, two frame offset from the body. You, if you ever forget these, you can always do grab here, check it here. Okay, six is where they rotate, X is at for the body. So for the head, we'll go to seven. Maybe we'll offset it more later, but we can do this now. And in, in the head, remember, it is Z for our particular rig. So we're going to bend that down a little more on frame 7. And then we're going to drag that to frame 16 and copy it. It will probably happen on frame 19. You can check that. Yep, the body is on 18, so this will be on 19. And then as it comes into the up, we'll go to contact position. And that is when the head reaches its maximum lift and rotation here. Okay. So we'll do the same on this contact pose. Copy that over. And maybe we'll, we might end up toning that down. That seems a bit much but it's a good place to start from where we don't have wall smacks. So if we go in here to our rotations and just offset everything, we're gonna see the ones we gotta fix. So we'll move this one on frame seven for the Z. For both the neck and the head, we'll move from seven to one and then we'll copy one to 25 and bam move it back if you have view show buffer curves and put that on and then go to buffer curve snapshot you'll have a reminder of where your curves used to be and then we're going to check all of our rotate y's too so Got to add a key on one of those controls, so we'll put that in now. We'll drag it from 10 back to 1, same sheet. Bam. The X is working fine, so we'll leave that there. I think we can tone a lot of what's happening in the head down. I don't really like the angle of the neck and the head there. So first thing we can do is half it. Five, slash equals two to half, divide it, right? Five equals two, so there we go. And a lot of times when you look at the head, you see a lot of movement in that. That's being driven by the spine because it's all FK here. So to dial this stuff down, we should really get into, you know, how much the chest is rotating back and forth. So we can half that stuff, this stuff as well. But it's, it's smarter to 
start really from the root of all the movement if you want to start toning things down and we can we can do that here by going into the hip and now we're getting much closer to what we want we can still probably tone the chest down a little bit um, but the head is the upper body is feeling better before we start animating the arms, it would be great at this point to start toning down the body of movement. A lot of the movements throughout the body feel too exaggerated for a basic walk, just playing it back on the side. There's a lot of swing back and forth here. Uh, there's a lot of side to side with the character as well as the rotation Z up here. Uh, it's good that we went to the extreme first because it's always easier to dial back than it is to add in. Um, but let's let's tone some of this stuff down and we can kind of get a better sense of this by looking at each view on its own. So if we go to the front view and I like to use these kind of film gates and um, grids to find out just how much in screen space things are moving and we can, we can uh, make visual adjustments much faster that way. Um, so right off the bat, I think the character is moving too much side to side based off of our grid. And if we play this back, he goes back and forth a lot. The dominant movement should really be, it should really feel like the dominant movement is that he's walking forward, not so much that he's, he's doing a lot of side to side on top of that. So the easy way to do this is to just pull up your graph editor, so we could adjust this visually, but I like to, since everything's working, we can just select what we have. Hit slash equals in the value portion of the graph editor and then hit two. That divides everything that we have in half and scales it down equally without us trying to eyeball it all, right? And already that feels a lot better as far as his movement is concerned side to side. Along those lines, we could probably tone down the rotate Z. And if we make any mistakes, you know, this is this is art. We we go back and we we adjust it the other way to our liking, right? But I want to get something more toned down for a basic everyday walk. Because if we have things too exaggerated, that's when we get a lot of personality in there. It'll start to feel happy or sad, depending on how much we have. And so having that, that rotate Z feels good. Now let's just take a quick look at the upper body. I think we can tone down this side to side as well with the chest before we, we really let the arms depend on what the spine is doing. So we pull up our rotate Z for that and then we'll half that as well, half these two. How does this look? A lot more subtle and controlled in the chest, which is nice. And we'll have to counter, of course, with the head, since they're all dependent on each other, and we were animating the neck and the head extra to compensate. But it wasn't, it's a uh, rotate Y for this rig. Not C. So do the same there. And then the head of our character is a lot more stable too. He stays more in the center throughout the walk. Okay, now let's look from the side view. Not too bad overall. I think we can just tone down the chest area with the bend forward a bit. Again, this is, this is kind of up to what we prefer. But for a basic everyday walk, these things should be fairly subtle if we don't want to have a lot of personality. From there, we can tone down the head a little more, maybe some other bits, but I think this is okay. The arms in a normal walk are very secondary, very lazy. We can, of course, do whatever we want, but their movement is really driven by what's happening in the body, and they're really counterbalancing the feet as we're falling. That's why we're focusing on the arms now towards the end of this, because if we changed anything in the spine, it would affect the arms. 
Now, can you guess where all the movement begins in the arm itself? All the movement comes from the upper body and the shoulder first. So that's exactly how we'll start and we'll work our way down. We can turn the arms on now, and I already have it in FK, meaning that it's all rotation with three joints. Um, if your arms are in IK, you'll want to switch it so that you get, you get the natural dependency of the arms on the chest. You get a little bit of free movement there, and you can't really stretch the arms beyond what they should be doing. So we're going to go to our down pose on frame four, rotate the arm down like it would be naturally for a swing. And then the first thing we're gonna do is just worry about our side view. So, you know, it's the swing back and forth here. And since this leg is forward, this opposite arm will be forward. And we can kind of keep this subtle, say negative 16 for now. Copy, copy the same thing to frame 16, but it will be the opposite. So it's the swing back, okay? And we need to have our cycle loop up, right? Because this is the contact frame, but we've only keyed on the down pose. So let's bring this back to frame one copy this to frame 25, and then slide it back to frame four. And now we've got a looping cycle here for our swing. Okay. If it's too subtle, of course, we can always make changes. You know, we can, we can make this twice as much very easily just by dragging this out of it. But since this is the upper bit of the arm, it really only needs a little bit of movement because there's going to be a lot going on in the hand. So on the contact pose, we can assume that the hand should be close to where it is on four. So it should be really easing into this position like the graph editor is automatically doing. And then on the passing pose, we're really easing out of it, just like the graph editor is doing. We can make this more exaggerated, um, of course. Just by tweaking the tangents, you can make them weighted. This keeps us from adding extra keys. Shift selecting to grab both, and you can widen that out so there's more of a drag and it whips through faster, right? But maybe that's too push for now, so we'll, we'll just kind of leave it at default. It's good enough for a first walk. This provides that natural speed up in through the middle, right, that you want. So that's what you should take away from this. At this stage two, you might find that um, adding this arm swing becomes difficult with your rig. After you set a couple keyframes, all the, the different rotation axes, you might see them flip around a crazy amount, like they flip extra like that. Um, this is called gimbal lock, which, which is a whole other tutorial, but just know that the fastest way to avoid all of that is to focus on your rotation order. So if I open up the attribute editor here for the upper arm, I'll see my rotate order is Z, Y, X. So when I first rotated the arm down, it was this Z axis to get it into position. This rig, I believe, started in X. So um, when I rotated it down on Z, it created a bunch of extra rotation, right? Uh, I wasn't able to just get this swing back and forth on one axis, it was a couple. So they started to overlap and that created uh, a bit of gimbling. So that's how you fix it. You switch your rotation order to favor the rotation that you need first. So you can change it to whatever you need. And like a pendulum, the arm swing uh, should be the lowest in the passing position or going through the middle phase of the swing, right? So um, as the shoulder really drives the upper arm, we should be thinking about animating this as well, at least in one rotation. So I'll set a key on my contacts where the shoulder is highest 
And then right on our passing pose on frame seven, we can drop the shoulder, which will give us a deeper arc to that arm as it comes back. Much more of a natural movement. And we can apply the same rotation to frame 19. Now if we check the front view and make sure that isn't too pushed, maybe we can push it more. You know, let's get crazy. Negative 16. Okay, cool. Now we've got a bit of a deeper swing and overlap to that arm. You can see it here in the graph editor while tapping. We'll just cycle that. All right, so now with a forearm, just like the rest of our body, not every part of the arm arrives at the same time. So we'll key the extreme for the forearm control this elbow two frames after the upper arm. So if we check back to the upper arm, we're arcing on four and 16 on our down poses. So two frames after is 16, right? So as this swing is starting to come back, this forearm reaches its maximum forward swing here on frame six. And then we can copy that knowing that the down is here, two frames after is 18, and we will do the opposite. So we could say 19, and then you see we get this break in the elbow, which, um, you know, is totally valid as a way to get more flexible arms. But for this walk, we're trying to keep it more subtle and realistic. It's, it's kind of slow. So um, we'll just keep the elbow fairly straight about here, okay? The most bend is here, and then it comes back, right? And that gives us the two keys we need to get the forearm in shape. Pretty simple. We do need to cycle it, though. So, of course, we'll bring this back to frame one. Throw a little trick here to then frame 25 and bring it back to frame six. That way we have some animation here in the beginning that hooks up. And same at the tail end. So if we play this back, got a decent swing in there, right? Not too bad. I can hide the controls to make it more clear. And now we're ready to obviously apply this to the hand control. So since the hand is even further behind the forearm, we'll key this not on frame six, but frame eight. So there's some drag there. Keep in mind, you can do this all visually. Like the more that you animate, you can just kind of guess how much you think you want things to drag. You don't always have to have it a two frame offset between each control, or you know you can key things all on the same frame and just control your overlap on your own. But since this is formulaic and probably one of your first animations or early animations, this is a good way to start. So 8 and 20 will be our keyframes for the hand. And as this arm starts to come forward, this hand really is dragging back, it's dragging behind. And this gives us natural overlap through that arm swing, right? And we have to cycle this too, just like everything else. You're going to be so good at this by the time the walk is over that uh, you can do it without thinking. We've got natural swing into the arm. And real quick to some things that may be bugging you is the fingers. We can we can just kind of give a natural pose to our fingers and put it in local mode and kind of twist this around just so that the hand is more relaxed. Um, and I, can, I won't be keying anything, but this just gives us a better, more appealing hand pose without us really doing any extra animation. That's the power of a nice pose, you know. You can see the level of detail we can start to get into with our animations when you're looking at things like that. But now the hand pose feels better. The thumb could use some work, but it's good enough. It's not as obnoxious as this thumb hanging out and then, you know, that being just in a T pose. Overall, our arm is looking good from the side view. Uh, there's a nice swing in there that took us, you know, no time at all to put in. Um, but from the front, you know, if we look at it, it's wall smacking. It feels very rigid. It feels very stuck in one place. 
as it swings forward, you know, it's, it's just kind of like, like this. Well, because we haven't even considered any of the roll and twist that's happening in our arms. So obviously we need to put that in there. A lot of walks forget to cover things from all angles. Maybe they think it's too complicated for people to hear, or maybe they don't know to consider this. But I want to go here so that you really think about how there's rotation and movement in all of the joints from all angles. This provides the, you know, the really the most fluid movement, and this this will ring true even in our side view because we'll get you know a bit of twist. We'll get the shape change that we'll see. Um, to make that movement more more fluid. A common way to get this to happen is to have a figure eight in the arm. So if we take the wrist here, our tracker will make this clearer visually. So we can see the overall arc of the arm right now. It's just one you know big circle and it gets it gets a bit of a figure eight right now. Um, from the side view we get this uh, loop back forward and then it crosses over itself before it loops back, and that gives us a figure eight from this way. But we also want it from the front. You know, we don't have a lot of depth there, and that will give us a, a nice fluid movement. We could get by with this, but we're gonna take it to the next level. So select the upper arm control again, and we will start with the rotation Z first. Right now, it's only got one keyframe on there, just for the down position of this, we can delete it. And we'll go to frame eight. So we know our arm in this position is, is just one frame after the passing pose, you know, the farthest movement over. So at this point, it's a safe bet that, you know, this will be a wider swing in the walk, right? As the arm starts to come back, it swings out more this way. And then we could say at the other passing pose, maybe that's the other point where on, you know, on frame 20, it's at the widest point as it's coming forward again, right? It comes out away from the body. Of course we can change this, but for now, that's where we'll have it. Now, at some point along halfway through here, we're going to want that arm to you know, swing in as well, not just out, and that will give us a change, give us a real arc to the front view. And it's gonna be something subtle because what we want to be dominant is that swing forward and back. Let's say, let's say 14, frame 14. I'll just kinda eyeball this and see how it looks, but as it swings back, it comes in a bit closer on frame 14 and now we need some change after 22. So as it swings forward, we can have that arm really swing more in towards the body. This happens quite a bit in real life. There's, there's, there is some pull in and out with the arm as it goes forward and back. So this swing forward will probably come a bit later, maybe closer to 25, but I think the easiest way to do this is to cycle it. And we'll go to frame one. And we'll copy this to frame 25. And now we know we bring this back to frame eight. If we just try to keep our timing the same between this. So this is, this is a quick change in timing. It's only three frames to get to that jump, right? Compared to the eight and 14 there. So we could probably bring this to yeah, 25, 26. And that's 26 is like the halfway point. Right. We don't have to be so mathematical, we can do this visually. You can just watch the hand or you can turn on an arc tracker. And you see that we now, from this, this front view, if we look over top, we have a figure eight. And it's worked its way in there just with these two rotations to have a bit of a figure eight at the top too. So if you're watching the arm, we turn this off. We'll go to the graphic view, hide the controls, just kind of watch how that arm moves. You can see how much it swings out and in, right? And we could easily go and adjust this here so that it swings in a lot more. 
Maybe it swings out less. Same deal here. We'll um, we'll keep it from wall smacking by by getting into the rotate Z first. Except this time, you know, like I said, we're going to work more visually uh, with this arc tracker. So on frame, yeah, let's say frame six. Let's let's make sure that it's it's kind of pointing back where it came along that arc, right? Hand is pointing back this way where it came from. Key that there. It's following this this arc this this arc that we have in the figure eight, it just does it a few frames later than the upper arm does. So we're trying to consider that as it comes back. And then as it comes out this way, we're gonna say, you know, kind of bend back this way. And then 23, see this is the wide point of the arm swing based off of our arc. 23 is a couple frames after, so we can see that like so. And then we need we need to figure out how that arm really whips forward into this position. The easy way to do that again is to go into our graph editor and just make some adjustments. You don't really need, you don't need a lot of keys for this. You can get yourself backed into a corner where you get confused where it's delaying the most if you start adding a ton of keys. So we'll go back, take this back to frame six. And now, if we play this section through, it feels all right. To take it to the next level, we need to obviously add a bit of the palm rotate in there. So we'll, just for now, we'll key it on the same frames as the Z uh, based off what we know about the palm. So as it's coming forward, we, we like the palm to kind of twist in to face us more, face our character more. Maybe that's too much, maybe not, but for now it's good enough. And then as it comes back, it will open up, right? And we can slide all this back to frame one, copy it over. Frame 14, we might already be, be opened up more, right? Getting to that extreme point. Follow our figure eight a little more. And then on frame 23, you know, maybe we're already leading this, this palm in more. And then just so everything is not on the same time and we're closer to the timing that we set for the, the upper arm as far as the twist goes. Remember, we look at the upper arm, we check this rotate Y twist. It's happening on frame one, so we could probably be a couple frames after that. You know, if we just take our rotate X and then the extreme for this will be uh, a couple frames later, let's say, uh, let's say like that, it gives us a bit of, a bit better overlap considering that the rotate Z rotations were happening in the same frame before. So the other things to really look out for when you wash your hand moving back is now, is it toned down enough the way we like it so that it's not dominating too much of the walk? It's not too flashy, not too rotating. Um, the only thing that you can go in and do is just kind of take a look at your extremes. So when we started with this and, and it was more extreme here, so there was a bit more rotation very quickly and it added a lot of extra roll as the hand comes back. If you play it, it feels, feels a bit off there. So one thing you do is you can kind of make it more subtle, right? Just half it. We can also kind of make sure that if this is zero, how much we're going over that center line. And you know, we can, we can half this as well and then see what we get. So 
you know, all that side to side rotation is much less extreme, much less showy then, but we are getting shape change as the hand rolls back. There's a bit of shape bending this way to keep it from just looking dead. Right? It looks very organic just to have even, even the slightest bit of rotation on there. And it looks like it matches what, what a hand is supposed to do in a walk. So not perfect, not utterly amazing, but good enough to where our walk starts to feel supernatural. And from the side, we've considered all axes. It didn't take that long, just a couple extra minutes. At this point, we're in the polish phase. So we're wrapping this walk up, and now we're just working on uh, the final touches to make sure it's as smooth as possible. It's really time to clean up these last few bits. That means we're going to be toning down any movements that feel too exaggerated. We're going to be cleaning up knees as much as we can so they don't pop, adding little bits like toe overlap for extra flexibility. Um, and copying over the arms and the feet so that they are identical. We can also take this time to experiment with slight offset changes or adjustments to the feet arcs and hand arcs here and there. We can play with that all day. Um, I think the things right now that stand out to me the most are, you know, we could tone down a bit of how the arm swings out to the left and the um, and then tone down the hand to match it a bit as far as how the palm opens up. The leg is really robotic on a, it kind of hits this wall here as it plants and goes back on a rail and the pickup and arc can be a bit better we can add some toe overlap and then um, you know work on these knees so let's do some of that now um, first let's just tone down the the arm we'll say at this point where the arm swing is the widest, it doesn't go as wide. So we turn that down at least by half and see how that feels. It feels much more controlled now, more relaxed. And then handle the hand as well. Just take all this, half it, and you know, we adjust the splines a little bit so that it's smoother have that a bit taller so there's some change there in the roll and it should keep the hand very subtle from the front as it goes back you could also probably tone down the the way the the neck and the head bobs forward. So let's try that out now. That's a Z rotation, so let's just bring that down. Let's see how that feels. A little more controlled. I think we can tone the neck down further. Let's just take all this and half it. Much more subtle. You know, we could even start offsetting the head a little bit from the neck, so you know, the, the joints are a bit more broken up, so we could slide that one frame off. See if that feels feels a little better, feels a little smoother. It's still very subtle. Good enough for now. Uh, not gonna get too picky with everything. So now that we have the arm toned down, we can make sure that this is cycled so that we can copy it to the other arm. Might as well get that in. Uh, make sure everything is here is cycled. I think everything is good to go. We've covered that pretty well. Okay, cool. So now we go here, and first thing you want to do is if you've changed the rotation, or definitely, you know, if this was X, Y, and Z, change it to Z, Y, X, because that's what we did for this arm. So, otherwise your rotations be messed up. So, 
we'll just you can try to copy these all together but sometimes it gets a bit messy if like for the shoulder you've only rotated one control so let's go here go to frame one back that up frame one shoulder to shoulder control and now it's copied exactly let's copy all these rotates let's copy from here to here, control V, copies and paste. So we can see we don't have the, the hand or the elbow in there. But it's exactly the same for the upper arm. So good for now. And then because we didn't have the key here, frame six, slide that back so that it matches. Copy all this on frame six. Frame six there. And it should be identical. So if we pull these up, check them real quick. Good. Okay. But obviously, this needs to be the opposite because. If this leg is forward, this hand shouldn't be forward, it shouldn't be back, so we need to just kind of take take all of our animation, and since it's cycled, we can just slide it all back. So I'll select each control, go into the graph editor here, go to the time portion, minus equals 12, and then we should get what we need, because that's exactly 12 frame difference from our walk, right? Each step is 12 frames, so 1 to 13, that's 12 frames. Then we get it all perfectly in sync. Right? And, you know, we, we can we can either copy the, this pose for the fingers that we have from the other hand so that this is cleaner, or we can just, you know, rough it in. We don't have to be too picky about it. Probably something like that. So we'll do the same thing as far as copying the arms to each other. We'll do that to the legs. Uh, we just got to go in though and really work on this foot arc because there are some some big problems in there as far as you know, like I said, this foot being on a rail and the arc um, before we copy it over. If you look at the foot, it's kind of awkward that it's perfectly straight. We tend to walk with a little bit of an angle, so we can put that in. Let's put that into where the foot contacts even. You know, maybe we add a bit of bank to the foot one way or the other. These men tend to walk with their feet out a little bit, uh, depending on the person, of course, or the gender. You might point your toes in instead of out, and you might bring them closer or not to the center of your body. So that's good. Just remember you have to copy whatever you're doing to the last frame here so that it's exact. And as the foot comes down, there's a little bit of a change there. And we'll want to keep the same thing when the foot is here. But you notice because it's now that we have the now that we have the heel raise involved and it's rotating from the heel, it's kind of off the pivot for where the weight is on the toes, right? So this is where it gets a bit technically tricky with, with 3D to just get smooth twist into the feet. But thankfully, this rig has some nice extra tools to help you work around that. So I'll just stamp some keys down here. So I'll stamp a key before the the heel raise is even involved here. And let's just rotate that foot out with it. And you see how the pivot is now on the toes. So it will work, even though it's getting away from that control. We're, we're just looking at where the foot is in the screen space. And the twist will be most extreme here before it lifts. So 
we'll be cushioning into that. Checking our graph editor and see how much we're cushioning. This toe pivot. And we're going to have to clean up this foot arc, obviously, to match it. And we'll have to end this rotation over one frame, just like we did the heel raise, to make, make our rotations and not be fighting this as well as the toe rotate, right? First, though, let's make sure we got the foot doing what we want here while it's planted. So let's kill that rotate Z. It's hard to put weight on a foot on the side. It comes down there. A bit of a roll and angle to it. It holds that angle. Check our graph editor for that rotation. Gives our foot a little bit of movement as it plants so that it's not dead on a rail. Here we need to be careful though about the foot sliding around too much because if it slides too much then it feels like there's no weight on it, at least side to side. And part of the problem is that we have this toe is engaging on this frame and we still have the rotate there so we'll need to kill that over one frame just to make it as clean as possible and rotate that accordingly so that it's close. Right. That was the problem. We should have this keyed at zero. We didn't have that keyed. And then bring this back. It's too far out. Okay. I just watching this back heel, I want to make sure that it continues to roll. Ah, uh, there's still some rotate Y on there. That's the reason, the root of the problem. So it can get a bit tricky to remember to look out for everything that you've keyed. But just remember where you've changed things on one frame and when things should be zero. That's why it's handy to have this one frame switch so you're not working with multiple numbers and counter animating things. Now it plants and continues with this, this rotation from the toe without smacking any walls and it keeps progressing, right? Just the slightest of movement and translation there across screen space. And later we can go back and add more if we feel like it should slide a little bit to feel more fluid. And maybe we want, you know, this more kicked in towards the body. That's another option too. So we can we can change that. We can bring that foot closer towards that center line. So that he's more balanced just by dragging the entire X translate X curve in and it keeps everything preserved. And then as this foot lifts we'll need to match it, of course, and all this new rotation that we gave it from the side and the twist, the toes, and we can make the toes a little, like, since it's a one frame difference, there needs to be a very slight change, even though it's a fast out into the top of the foot arc. It would be nice if we could get a little bit more 
close to the toe bend, right? It's a little ease, a little bit more ease out of that spacing. And then I'm just watching the ankle and where the, f the leg connects to the foot to see if from all angles, if we are matching that rotation closely enough for it to be a smooth pickup, right? We want a little bit of change in the angle of the heel, so it's a bit higher. It's very subtle. Here the foot is probably still pointing back. The other thing to note is that the computer is the world's worst in-betweener, so it doesn't know when you want to slow out. It automatically causes an ease in and ease out for, for all of your keys, so you need to get in here and tell it when you don't want it to slow out. Since we're really faking this one frame switch, um, we need to go to curves, weighted tangents, break it, and we don't want to ease out. We want to go quickly into this rotation that we have so it doesn't take its time getting there because the foot is moving at a, at a fast rate here. Every, every part of the foot move needs to be quick until it gets here. And we could probably delay this rotation even more so that the foot is really catching up the leg just like the hand did with the arms. And we can tweak this before we go much further with those rotates. Let's tweak the translation. Now let's adjust this foot arc so translation wise when it picks up we turn our arc tracker on. We can see that this is a bit spiky and and not quite a, a nice loop into the contact position. Here, especially with our rotates, the foot kind of, uh, if you watch the toes, has a kind of funky wobble to it. So we can go in here and just go to, you know, visually you can do this, and watch your graph editor along the way, and we can have it, to make it not so spiky, we can give it a couple more frames to come over, right? So that it's a nice loop in, right? And then we can also dial this down so it doesn't swing out so hard. hard. I will cushion this even more. And of course our rotates are very dependent on that, so we have to adjust them. Maybe it's not so quite so much of a rotate out that way. So the other thing we can do to ease, it's a bit awkward how, how the foot is rotating into this position now. Since we have the foot out that far, we should have not have this rotate really dipping down here, but it needs to be higher so it eases more into that position, right? We can make that smoother. On both sides. The foot really comes out and into it, and then we get a much smoother step. So pretty smooth. Not perfect, but good enough. Good enough to learn a lot from this walk. Um, the other thing we can do here is to add some flexibility to the foot is give it a bit of toe drag. So if we go to the raised toe, and here when it's in the passing position, we can drag it back like where it came from. 
and then here in the up position, it's dragging even more. So that when we get to the contact frame, the toes are up. The foot is flicking forward with the move, right? So the toes will flick through and then by the down pose, we're gonna have a one frame change here to give it some snap. So we key on frame four and frame five, and then on frame four, we're gonna kick the toes way up. And if we copy this over, one thing we could do, you gotta smooth that curve off the graph editor hookup, is delay this an extra frame. As the toe arrives first, it's nice to have this swing through where the toes haven't quite caught up yet on the contact frame. And then as it comes down, it picks up speed in toe, right? So maybe we delay that a bit, right? Some nice flexibility in there and overlap. At this point, we're, we're like at 98% done and we just gotta get in there and work on some knee popping. So this is what typically inspires rage uh, animation wise in walks. This is the bane of most animators existence uh, where they go into a spiral of doom trying to get knee pops to uh, be, the, the knees to be smooth and to not to pop. The, the knee should always be progressing and if at any point it stops like here where it barely covers any ground and then it moves again and there's a big spacing change, that's a pop. Uh, it breaks up the smooth movement of the knee, and anytime there's a big jump, like between frame one and frame two here, there's a pop. So we gotta get in there and smooth that out. Uh, what makes this uh, really difficult to do is that it's a combination of everything. It's a combination of how you've translated your hips, how high up and down uh, you know your character is, how far the leg is coming forward, how you're rotating it. Um, so typically people go into a spiral of doom with this where it drives them insane because they're trying to fix that while they're animating their legs and their, their hips and they're not saving it for the end of the walk. So we're just going to use stretch and it's basically frame by framing this to keep the knees smooth. And it's a bit trickier since the, the walk cycle is happening, he's walking in place and we're not covering ground. There's a point where, you know, obviously this contact frame, if he was walking forward, this knee would be, you know, further forward than it is here. When he hits the down pose, it comes, comes ahead. And in the up pose, it's also ahead of the contact. So we've got a choice where we can either make this less or the down pose less. And I kind of, I, I like the bend that we have here for the squash of the contact. So I'm going to try to keep that the same and cushion into this more with the, the up pose. So this is a cheat to make it work because we're growing the legs and shrinking them to make the movement smooth and keep that knee going forward. So I'm just watching this crease in the leg to tell me if this is progressing at a proper speed. And that feels pretty smooth for now. You might have to fine tune it when it gets a little slow like this and key that a bit extra. Here I'm going to add slightest bit of leg stretch. See there's a big spacing jump here and then it stops. Graph it makes it easier to be precise. This is where it gets tricky because it loops over itself. So 
if you're just washing that knee. All right, so a little meticulous there, but we got through it. And judging by the graph editor, you know, it's not what you necessarily expect. And we can go into the orthographic to be a bit more precise if we want about where that knee is traveling and where it's not. So here we might be able to stretch it out a little bit more. The other thing we can do is we can start keying the knee slide. So I'm just going to key over top of every frame that I have with stretch so that we don't lose anything if we start adding the knee slide in. Okay. And what the knee slide will do is let us change where this knee is. So when we have a jump like this, we can use a combination of the two to get a smoother change. See how that's smoother? Spacing-wise, maybe we favored this key because it goes, shoots up to the top pretty quickly. Going to create a little more change there. There's still a big jump there, so let's try and work that out. Because this is all happening on one frame, and the more that you do this, the more that you're going to easily be able to adjust things and see the spacing changes. So don't beat yourself up if you can't get the knees perfectly straight, arcing perfectly, and and uh, spacing perfectly. And it is a difficult thing to do frame by frame in 3D, especially when you're starting out. But as you can see, just playing this back. I can hide this grid there. Now it feels a lot more solid. Um, it feels purposeful. There's a that there's a little bit of jiggle in the knee when he plants. It's hard to get that rid of that completely, but at least in this leg now it feels a lot more sol solid and a lot less wobbly compared to the foot that's behind it. Right? If you can squint and try to watch one and then the other, you'll see what I'm talking about. So at this stage, we are good to wrap this up. The only thing we need to do is copy that foot over and we are done. So, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll go to perspective and show our controls again and select this guy, control C. Blast away all the keys there, control V, and now our foot is identical. And obviously, we've got to change it. Um, first thing we'll do is make sure everything is cycled. Slide all of this back 12 frames, minus equal 12. And there it's in perfect position. And we need to change the rotations as well. But first, let's make sure we copy over the toe pivot and make sure that's cycled. And we can adjust the cycle. So go here, flatten that out. Bring that back. Okay, so we're good there. And now we can copy this. So frame seven, copy control C and then control V. And now, we slide this back 10 frames, 12 frames should be happening at the right time. One 
frame off. Yep, just one frame off and then it's fine. And we need to reverse this. So this will be divide equals negative one. Flips it in place. So we get the foot rotating the other direction so that it's natural and he's not constantly walking the same, both feet rotated that way. Um, and we'll clean up the tangents after we flip everything else. And so we'll flip these, divide equals one, mirrors everything. Okay. these tangents. And the same has to happen for the rotate z. Y equals negative one flip. So we also need to mirror the translate x obviously because it's going the other direction. There we have it. Did we forget anything? Doesn't look like it, foot looks solid. So now we've got both feet in line, both hands in line, the whole walk is wrapped up. You know, we can keep tweaking things from here, maybe we dial down how much that foot kicks out as it kicks forward, right? How much rotate there is from from this so he's not so uh, penguin walking. We can make that more subtle. We can also make it more subtle how far that foot comes out from his, his body here as it goes back. We can tweak arcs on the feet. We can, uh, you know, maybe delay more things on the spine and the head. But overall, I think this is a pretty good generic, uh, natural, basic walk that people do every day, trying to keep the personality out of it, keep it simplified. And there we go. Be sure to hide the last frame, frame 25, as that's the, cycle, the part where the cycle repeats, and you'll get a smoother hookup when you play it back, and there is going to be a smoother play blast, obviously, and if you're going to render or anything like that, it'll it'll work out. Um, it's something to keep in mind to always do that whenever you're cycling. At this stage, we can call it good enough. It's far from the best animation walk cycle ever, but it's a great exercise to really develop your animation skills. If your cycle looks almost as fluid as this, fantastic job you're more than ready to level up to something more challenging. If not, give it another try or move on to a different animation and circle back to this. Trust me, nobody ever becomes a pro because their animations were amazing. It always takes some practice, otherwise everybody can do it. And to help you keep improving, I'm gonna give you another in-depth video tutorial. All you have to do is go to this link on rustyanimator.com and you're gonna get a free run cycle animation tutorial that walks you through it step by step. You can click here or in the description below. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you've picked up some great animation techniques that will take you to the next level. If you're in search of more animation knowledge bombs and inspiration, be sure to visit us at rustyanimator.com. Until then, happy animating.